October before Luisa decided to speak to Maureen privately. For the past few weeks, she'd been mostly silent in class. She kept her head down and did her work, turned in her color wheels and her value exercises and her single light still lifes, said little during crits. She was also taking sculpture, drawing, and art history. Three days a week, she rose at 4 a.m. to work the breakfast shift in the dining hall, scrubbing dishes and flipping French toast alongside a handful of financial aid kids and the Cape Verdean kitchen workers who spoke to one another in rapid fortunes. She was always scrambling, always treading water, one little slip, one missed deadline or bout of the flu, and she'd fall irrevocably behind. She pinned her hopes on winter exhibition at the end of the semester. If she managed to win one of the cash prizes, she'd be able to cut down on her work study hours in the spring. When Luisa hung back after class and asked Maureen if she had a minute to talk, Maureen peered at her over her glasses as though surprised that Luisa possessed the power of speech. That depends, she said. Is it an honest to God 60 second minute or a half hour minute? I have a department meeting at 5.30. 10 minutes? Luisa's voice came out small and hard as though there was something lodged in her throat. Maureen seemed to soften. 10 minutes I can do, sure. If you don't mind tagging along while I pick up a copy. Thank you, ma'am. Maureen smiled in amusement. You don't have to call me ma'am. As soon as they were outside, Maureen produced a pack of cigarettes from her shirt pocket and tipped it toward Luisa. Smoke? Was she joking? She didn't appear to be, and Luisa didn't smoke, but she accepted anyway, cupping her hands around the cigarette as Maureen sparked it for her, trying not to cough. Maureen led the way across the green. The treetops were aflame. Every time Luisa went outside, she wanted to paint them. On the main quad, the Occupy Run encampment was a, was a hive of activity. It had been up for nearly three weeks now, but the administration seemed to view it as just another student installation that would eventually fall apart. In the center of the encampment, a boy in a bright yellow hoodie juggled oranges while a girl spoke into a megaphone. We're angry about the amount of debt we must go into to attend the school and the appalling lack of employment opportunities. Luisa felt a tin twinge of sympathy. She tried not to think too hard about the money she'd borrowed to come here. Maureen gestured at the protesters. I'm with them, she said, a cigarette dangling from the corner of her lips, bobbing as she spoke. But if you wanted was a job, you shouldn't have gone to art school. Anyway, what's up? I wanted to talk to you about my work. I want to get better. I mean, obviously that's why we're all here, but I was wondering if you had any more advice or... Luisa's last two canvases, landscapes inspired by photos she had taken back home, had received similar receptions to her Ibis painting. During the crits, she found herself hyper fixated on Karina, but both times her roommate had remained silent. Luisa hadn't looked in Karina's sketchbook since the evening of her first crit, though she wanted to. She'd felt this way about other girls before, brief, confusing infatuations that vacillated between attraction and jealousy, between wanting to touch the girl and wanting to be the girl to slip inside her skin, but never this intensely. She never told anyone about these feelings, never acted on them. Her crushes on boys had always felt straightforward in comparison, easier. In the doorway of Feeney's coffee, Maureen tossed her cigarette butt onto the curb. Luisa did the same, feeling guilty for littering. Inside, jazz was playing and there were unappetizing vegan pastries on display. Maureen ordered a latte and jerked her chin at Luisa. What are you having? Just a tea. What kind, said the barista, a gaunt girl with a pierced lip and a tattoo of a, of a pineapple on her bicep. Uh, green, thank you. Sullenly, the barista began banging around with the espresso machine. Look, said Maureen, handing the cashier her credit card. I'm gonna tell you what I tell everyone. At this stage in your education, at least half of what you make is going to be trash. Okay. So my advice to you is this. At the end of every year, take half of the work you made and destroy it. Destroy it? <laughs> yes. Take a knife to it or paint over it. Your work isn't precious. You have to be able to reinvent yourself. It's hard what you're trying to do here. You're chasing something that will constantly evade you. It's like trying to catch water in your fist. Okay, but is there something specific about the work that 
I should address, or? Maureen looked at her with sympathy. My dear, kill the Southern Gothic. Stop trying to perfect what you're already good at. You're here to take risks, to fail. Paint something completely different. Spend a month focusing on a single color, or experiment with a new medium, or paint rhinoceri, or ham and cheese sandwiches, or I don't know, vitiligo. What's that? A skin condition, Maureen said, <laughs> accepting her latte from the barista. Very striking to look at. <laughs> vitiligo, Louisa repeated, struggling to hide the doubtfulness she knew her expression betrayed. Maureen blew on her coffee and took a sip. I'm sorry, I've got to go. Come to my office hours if you want to talk more. When Maureen was gone, the barista handed Louisa her tea. I had a class with her, she confided, sophomore year, painting two. That's the class I'm in now, said Louisa. She's brutally honest. Yeah, said Louisa, I'm learning that. One time she went on this rant about how impossible it is to make it as an artist if you're a woman. She said you get passed over in favor of lesser talents, you get groped and harassed, and dealers made comments about, her, about your body. She said this one famous artist, she wouldn't tell us who, once asked her her bra size. We all felt pretty dejected by the end of it, the girls in the class at least. Damn, said Lisa, are you a painter? The barista shrugged, yeah. Is that your major? It was, I graduated in 2007. Enjoy your tea. <laughs> Dust was falling as Lisa stepped back outside, a moody indigo creeping across the sky. She stood under the beanie's awning and debated what to do. She could go to the dining hall for dinner, but she wasn't really hungry, so that'd be a waste of a meal credit. She could go back to Hope and see what people were up to in the common room, but she didn't trust herself to be convincingly sociable in her current state, especially if drinking was involved. Or she could go to her studio and start a new piece. Maureen had assigned a grayscale painting, which pleased Louisa. She loved gray. It wasn't really a color. It was a vast expanse just beneath the surface of color. If you mixed red and green and a little bit of white, you'd get a neutral gray because red and green were on opposite ends of the color wheel. But if you bent that geometry just a little and swapped out the green for something yellower, you'd end up with a warm, sandy gray. When Louisa was eight or nine, mom had explained color theory to her, placing different swatches side by side against a sheet of white printer paper. Louisa would never forget how her perception shifted as her mother cycled through color combinations. A green that appeared green on its own became bluer or yellower or even slightly red when contrasted with the right color. It was like witchcraft. L later, Louisa had made magic with her paints. Fallow blue, the color of a deep, clear lake on a cloudless day, became a fathomless black when mixed with burnt umber. And cadmium orange and cyan made not the brown that she'd expected, but a plush green like algae in the spring. And I'll stop there. <laughs> So you depict them with real earnestness and sympathy. And on the other hand, you do occasionally poke fun at them. You know, you occasionally just a little bit undermine them, the way they, they, they sort of showmanship about them, about their competition with one another, you know, their, their moments of pettiness. So I wonder how you balance out in the book. Just, you know, your belief in art as a person who makes art 
person married to a painter, and on the other hand, your way of occasionally poking at these people, these characters. Well, I think earlier drafts were more heavy-handedly satirical, and I eventually landed on not wanting it to be a straight satire. I, I wanted it. I wanted these characters to to feel fully fleshed out and to feel, you know, to, to, to be characters that a reader would care about because those are the kinds of books that I love reading. I don't I don't really like novels that kind of where characters sort of repel you with their with their awfulness. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like there to be at least at least one thing that you can love about them. Um, I mean, I think I think they're earnest because a lot a lot of the ideas and the sort of anxieties and um, and yearnings that they have are ideas and anxieties and yearnings that I've had at some point in my life or continue to have as as someone who's you know trying to have a creative career and, you know trying to trying to make art. Um, but I think the satirical aspect comes in because I think that. The art world, like academia, as you know, is just kind of asking to be made fun of. <laughs> <laughs> so why not go for it? <laughs> so why not? Yeah, why not go for it? <laughs> yeah, so you love these characters on the one hand, but you have fun with them on the other, and I think that's such a great balance. Um, there are so many wonderful scenes in here where you have the, the student painters modeling for each other. I mean, they're always drawing one another. They need to be doing that all the time. Um, and they're paying really close attention to each other because they have to, not just in terms of um, their characters, their personalities, but just physically. So I wondered how you think about these fictional artists paying attention to each other, depicting each other. Is that in a sort of similar spirit to the way you as author had to you know, depict them, pay attention to them, paint them? Is there a way you can talk about that kind of attention that has to be paid? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the process of, of building a character in a novel as, you, as, you're, as you're writing it is a process of, well, for me, the characters don't emerge fully formed in my brain. I wish they did. I'm really envious of people who are able to do that. But it is sort of a process of observing them as they take shape and um, you know, paying close attention to you know, what they're telling you that they want to be. But the, a lot of the modeling scenes were actually based on um, my own experience working as an art model. I did that in college uh, for a couple of years. Um, I went to college right next door to the Rhode Island School of Design. So there were, those were available jobs. And that was a job that I took because I was 19 and I thought it seemed like incredibly you know, romantic to, to work as an artist model. It also paid like twice as much as, <laughs> as, <laughs> as any other campus job. Um, and there's, it's, a, it's very, very weird to just kind of have to like stand there and for three hours and just have people like stare at you um, and draw you. Um, but you sort of, there's a way in which they're not, at, at a certain point, they're not really seeing you. They're seeing you as, as you know, kind of like a collection of shapes occupying space. Um, and there are moments, I think, in the, in the novel where uh, characters are looking at each other really closely, but they're sort of seeing past each other. They're not, they're seeing what they want to see and not what's really there. Or, yeah. or you know, they're not quite seeing each other clearly. Yeah. Um, and I think some of that came from the experience of, of sort of being, being looked at really, really closely, but not really, be, not really being seen as, as myself, but as, you know, the, just the person who happened to be modeling that day. And that's something, the, the strip review of your book, which just ran a few days ago, talked about that being seen aspect, that that was important to the novel. Did you think about that in terms of you know, something you wanted? You wanted to see these characters, but also depict the, the process of being seen? Yeah, and I mean, I didn't, certainly I didn't start out writing this novel as, you know, I'm gonna have this as a theme. <laughs> um, it, kind of, it kind of emerged over the course of several drafts. Um, but uh, if you've read the novel, and I assume not a ton of people have, because it just came out today, <laughs> but some of you have, um, it, uh, it's told from the perspective of four, four very different characters whose lives are, um, uh, are intertwined, um, whose like, paths kind of cross. And they, I was interested in, A, 
depicting the same the same scene from multiple different perspectives to kind of show how you know how how differently people um, can interpret the same thing. And I was I was also interested in in sort of exploring the ways in which people can just completely misunderstand each other and not see each other clearly. Yeah, I think that's one of the great things about about the novel. And there are some terrific characters who are on the border of unsavory here, which I always enjoy. Um, <laughs> you know, you have a young artist named Preston who functions as a catalyst. He's a, every time he comes into a chapter, things are going to happen. You just know, oh my he's God. A this, he's a Captain Happen character. He's a Captain Happen character. Things are going to happen when he walks into the book. So I wonder if you thought about him that way, if when you were working on the, the plot of the novel, if you thought, I gotta get somebody in here who's gonna really ratchet things up. Is yeah. that how you conceived mm -hmm. him? Yeah, I had a, some initial drafts where he wasn't, he didn't have a point of view, he was just kind of there. Um, and um, the, the, the book was just kind of lifeless because I had characters who were just kind of passive and just kind of let things happen to them. Um, and I think it was my brother actually who read um, an early excerpt and said to me, you know, this character Preston, he's really interesting. I kind of want to get inside his head. What if, <laughs> what if you wrote from his perspective? So I did kind of as an experiment and I really, it was fun. Um, I think for me, fiction is a way of sort of enacting all my like worst impulses that I would never, that, that all you know, that I would never actually <laughs> act on in, re in real that. life. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, it's a, fiction is a safe place to be like, hmm, what if I said the most awful thing I could think of? What would happen? Yeah. Or what if I, what if I just com acted completely selfishly? What you know, what would that look like? What chain reaction would that cause? So you had that sort of fun with Preston and maybe with Robert, yeah. Also, and with you know with the with the female characters That's true. too. That's true. You know, some sometimes they they act very selfishly. They're very cruel to each other, mm -hmm. um, and you know I hope I'm not you know a selfish cruel person, but certainly I've had you know. I say that you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I've had I've had moments you know where yeah, I think everyone has moments where they you know the cruel streak wants to come out. Yeah, where would fiction writers be yeah. in the I think we're notoriously <laughs> terrible people. This is, this is what. <laughs> so can you talk more about the plot, how you came up with the plot? Because maybe you started with art school, you had this experience as a model, having done that when you were in college. But where did the plot come from? Because I think so many writers, you know, they're in love with language, they're in love with character, they're not necessarily, unless they're mystery writers, in love with plot. Yeah, plot is really hard for me. It doesn't it doesn't come naturally to me? Um, and in fact, there have been some early reader reviews of, of the book. Which I know it's terrible to like look at Goodreads, Don't look but I, I've done it. I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a common complaint is that this book has no plot and that nothing happens, which I, by the way, I disagree with. I I think it does have a plot. Um, <laughs> It doesn't have explosions or dragons in it, but it, I assure you it has a plot. Um, I wish I could tell you that I had, you know, concrete, conscious reasons for, for, for doing, for making certain narrative decisions, but a lot of it was honestly just trial and error and, and sort, of, sort of an intuitive process where I was just kind of fumbling around in the dark and showing it to um, you know, people in the MFA, um, who I should say, Julie was my thesis advisor. Um, <laughs> um, and so, and I wrote most of this book, or I wrote, I finished this book in, in an MFA program where I, I, I was really lucky. I had this big community of readers um, to give me feedback. And, you know, I, a lot of it was just kind of, you know, d bumbling around in the dark and then showing it to people whose opinion I trusted. and asking, does this work? Do you want, does it make you want to keep reading or are you bored? And going off of that advice. I did have a whole an Excel spreadsheet at one point kind of mapping out all the plot beats, but that didn't happen until the last few drafts when, when uh, you know, the, the story was pretty, you know, pretty set in stone at that point and I was just kind of moving scenes around to get the rhythm right. I remember at, at a certain point early on you were frustrated with the book, you were, you know, point at which every writer feels like 
I'm going to set fire to this thing out outside. Um, but you kept going. You persevered, which is terrific, and it was beautiful novel. But okay, give us your secrets and your tips. What made you keep going? What allowed you to continue to have faith in this book and to keep plowing ahead? Um, I have I have a a, a partner who I I, I consider he's my husband, I consider him a creative partner as well, who kind of believes in my work when I don't. And I think, I think every writer needs that. Whether It doesn't necessarily have to be someone you're married to, but <laughs> I think you need someone in your life who believes in your work, even when you don't. And in-house is nice. In-house is nice. Because when you're, like, when you're crying yourself to sleep at night, it's nice to have someone there who's like, no, it's not, it's not shit. It's, <laughs> it's actually good. <laughs> I remember also you were concerned at some point or another with the question of accessibility, whether for readers who didn't know much about painting and art, this would be you know accessible. They wouldn't feel shut out that this was some sort of specialty. And can you talk about ways in which you wrestled with that question, trying to make sure it was authentic in terms of portraying these artists who were engaged in you know, significant sophisticated work on the one hand, but on the other hand, being accessible to people who don't know about it. So what I did was I looked at a lot of books that focused on um, I, either sports or, or you know creative fields that I had no knowledge of. So for example, I read The Art of Fielding, which is a baseball novel. I, I don't I know nothing about, about baseball. I could not explain to you how the game works. Um, <laughs> and what works really well about that novel, if you haven't read it, is that um, the, it, the characters are just really fantastic. They feel like real people. And I, I knew that, that you can get through a book, you can enjoy a book and adore a book that takes place in a world that you have no familiarity with as long as the characters are people that you want to spend time with. So that was a real focus for me, to make sure that these were characters that, that people would, would want to you know, live with for, for days and days and days. Um, so that was one aspect of it. I did have a couple, my agent actually had me do a pass where I just cut kind of jargony stuff. Um, and that involved, I mean that involved just you know, very surgical edits, cutting sentences here and there that were just you know, maybe inaccessible um, or unnecessary. I just want to ask a couple more questions, and I want to give other people a chance to ask you questions. But um, how, how did the rest of the agent and editing process go? Would you talk about that? Yeah, so I did, I did one, one round of edits with my agent. Um, and then after we sold the book, I did one round of edits with my editor. Um, and my editor said something really interesting to me, which is that she said, first books are always in really good shape. Um, meaning that you know people who sell their first novels have probably worked on them for many many years and they're they're really really polished and she said that oftentimes she will publish someone's first novel and then buy the second novel and think to herself uh, is this the same writer now that 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 is a terrifying thing to hear <laughs> from from your editor whoops um, but yeah I mean I I. And I've, I've heard of, um, you know, I think people sometimes sell their books when they're not even fully, you know, finished yet, and they do a lot more, they work more, um, they do more heavy editorial work um, with the editor and do a lot more drafts. For me, we did one round of edits. Um, it took maybe a few weeks and, and then um, passed it off to production. Um, and I gather from most debut writers that I've talked to, that that is their experience, unless they had a very unusual situation where they sold the book before it was done. Yeah. And you are writing a new novel now. Yes, God, there, God help me. <laughs> you, a second novel, the one that's gonna be just at least as polished as the first one. Um, what lessons, if any, from writing Sirens and Muses are you able to apply? You know, did you feel like, now I've figured it out, I've got the Antonia Angers method. <laughs> no, I don't think writing one novel teaches you how to write another. Why? 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 <laughs> Explain that to a Um, I mean, I think every novel is its own, at least for me, it, so far, I say this having written a full draft and then throwing it away because it didn't work and started over. 
um, which is very dispiriting, but ultimately necessary. Um, I think every novel is its own universe, and you have to learn the rules of that universe to make it work. And I'm the novel that I'm writing next is is very different. It takes place. It's not about art. Um, it is about teachers, but you know, elementary school teachers, which is a very very different um, environment. Uh, it's first person, which is quite different than um, than this book, and it just it it's going to have different structure and the characters are very different. They're older. I got very tired of writing about twenty somethings <laughs> after, after I turned thirty. I can't. They start can't. To seem young I can't. Everyone. Yeah, they do. And I I started this novel when I was twenty three, so they were very close to my age. And then it, the older I got, the like the more impatient I became. Just like I, I can't. <laughs> I can't. No offense to the twenty somethings here. I just can't write about you anymore. <laughs> short story in my life. It wasn't very good. Um, I think the, the structure of short stories, would you say the structure of short stories is pretty, it's a, this is your cue, it's, right? a, it's a different, <laughs> well you write short stories too. I think it's a different skill, I think it's a completely different skill set. Um, and it's one that, it's not that I don't, I don't have it, it's just that I haven't practiced it, I haven't honed it. Um, okay, so the other question, you're really going to hate this question, but um, who are your Um, favorite novelists. Um, I really like um, I really like Curtis Sittenfeld, who's a mm -hmm. Minneapolis novelist. I like Britt Bennett. Um, I like Chimamanda Adichie, uh, Zadie Smith, Sarah Waters. You might notice a pattern. These are all novelists who sort of create these very like lush, immersive worlds. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think who else. Who else do I like? <laughs> I like Julie. I love Julie. Have you read her novels? <laughs> so, who does your publicist compare you to when you're pitching your book? Okay, so on the book jacket, they have compared me to this book to Writers and Lovers by Lily King, another favorite, and The Goldfinch by Donna Tart, also another favorite. Um, I have been told that this book is nothing like The Goldfinch. I've also been told that this book is exactly like The Goldfinch. I, I, I cannot tell you. Is there a gap you. in it? Sorry? Is there a gap in it? Um, okay. Yes, there is death in it. There is death. No murder, though. No murder. Uh, although that's the secret history. Um, I think it's maybe more like Writers and Lovers than The Goldfinch. It's, it's got similar themes to Writers and Lovers. <laughs> so, um, in writing about the art world, you know, you, you're married to a painter, but you're a writer, and so I'm curious to, to talk a bit about like just immersing yourself in that world. I write about art too. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> For the others who don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'd love to hear you talk about that. Well, so that it was, it was very accurate to me. Oh, I that's, the book that's good. I'm glad it was accurate. I'm really terrified that I made mistakes. <laughs> 
If I did, I maintain that this is a novel. And I, and I, and I don't, I don't, I owe you very similitude, but not absolute accuracy. Um, that, so I, this sort of got, started out as kind of a challenge to myself because I'm really not a visual thinker. I have, like, I have a terrible sense of direction. I, I don't, I have a lot of trouble um, sort of imagining 3D images in my head. Um, and so I, it, when I first started writing this book, it was kind of a challenge to myself. Like, can I, can I write an interesting novel about a very visual form that I'm not good at describing? Um, turns out I can. Um, <laughs> uh, a lot of it involved just writing, uh, sorry, reading a lot of art writers that I admire, um, but also just talking to artists. Artists have a very different way of talking about their work than writers do. Um, uh, it, a lot of a lot of it, in, you know, just involves you know talking to my partner and talking to artist friends and just sort of trying to see through their eyes um, and really paying attention to the kind of vocabulary that they used and um, the kind of verbs that they used and and um, and you know reading reading art writers whose work I found accessible and successful um, and and learning from them and pulling, you know, pulling lessons from their work. Emma. So you kind of have to reach this like other side of the process of the book to appear as an object in front of you to hold it. And I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit of what you're most proud of at this point, like what you feel best about like coming to this point with with your novel. What the 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 coolest thing has been um, so before a book is published, they send out ARCs, like advanced reader copies. Um, and so people have read it. Not, not a ton of people have read it, but people have read it. And every once in a while, I get a message online from a total stranger who's read it and really loved it. And that's really amazing. That's a really good question. So I should also say that it's not completely accurate to say that I invented all these out of thin air. There's a author's note at the end where I um, mention certain artists whose work I was inspired by. So they, these were either artists that, whose work I really like or artists whose work I found interesting um, for various reasons. Um, and I sort of use them as a jumping off point to um, kind of create um, these imaginary works. Um, I guess Louisa's art I had a lot of fun with and, and really love, partly because her work is based on an artist um, who I know personally named Kayla Zeke. Um, th this character is from um, um, Cajun country in Louisiana, which is very culturally specific. And this is an artist. Um, who um, lives, is from that, this area and lives and works there. Um, and I, uh, I went to one of her shows uh, and really loved her work and, and, and I'd, had a, I'd been having a lot of trouble um, figuring out what this character's work looked like. And I, when I saw this show, I had this moment where sort of like this eureka moment or this, like this moment of like kismet where I was like, this is, this is what it looks like. I'm gonna use this as a jumping off point. So she, she does the, these kinds of um, sort of, a lot of, a, a lot of her paintings are birds, um, specifically birds of South Louisiana, but I sort of took, um, took one of her paintings that had these like vaguely mythological elements. It was a painting of a, a woman with the head of a bird and wings sprouting out of her back with a siren, uh, which is part of where the title comes from. And I kind of tried to push that in a more grotesque direction. So in the, in the novel, Louisa starts making these 
these paintings of bird women, sirens that are um, that are like beautiful but grotesque at the same time. Um, and a lot of them sort of reference specific environmental challenges that um, um, South Louisiana has. So for example, one, um, one of the bird women is like covered in oil, um, where it's like spitting oil out of her mouth. And that was sort of a direct reference to um, the BP oil spill, which hap it, in the timeline of the novel happens like right before the novel begins. And it's sort of like this important event in, in this character's uh, backstory. Um, so a, a lot of a lot of it was sort of taking artists whose work I either really loved or was interested in for some reason and kind of pushing it in a more um, either in a direction that fit the character or in a in this case in a more extreme direction. Um, Louisa was a pretty difficult character to write, and she's the, in the section that I read, um, it's her point of view, uh, and she was the, the character that I began with, and I think she was difficult to write because she's quite a bit more passive than the other characters. I think active characters are easier to write. They, you know, they do things, and those things have consequences, um, and those consequences ripple outwards, but Louisa is a character who just kind of allows things to happen to her, and so I really struggled with, with her for a long time, trying to make her storyline interesting. Was it kind of a process for you, like, eight years? Seven. Seven. <laughs> 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 yeah, not quite that long. I have it right here, but I'm wondering through this whole process, what's the thing that kind of most surprised you? Um, I guess this, well, this wasn't exactly a surprise. I knew this intellectually, but it's one thing to know it and another thing to kind of experience it. When you, writing a, a novel and sort of being in the world of the novel, writing any book, I think, and being in the world of the book um, is very different than um, publishing it. Publishing and writing are very, very different things. And it's, it's it, it, obviously, it's, it's exciting to have your something that you wrote be like this physical object that people can buy and take home with them. But it's also very weird to be in a meeting with your publishing team and they're talking about it like this, like this object, like this commercial object, right? And the idea is to sell as many copies as possible. And so now, you know, there, there's this pressure on authors to, you know, to, to sell, to sell books. And, you know, it's, 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 it, it, in a sense, it is what I signed up for. But it's also like not at all what I'm, what I am trained to do. <laughs> I'm not a marketer. I'm not a publicist. I'm I'm a writer. So this is you know, kind of, goes against everything I've been doing. You know, very much in private and in isolation for eight years. So it was it was a su not a surprise in the sense that I knew it was coming, but it was a weird experience. So what we do is ask everyone here to promote the book. <laughs> 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 